And welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, we've had an incredibly strong response, uh, over, 100, over 800 registrations uh, for the webinar today, and we see the attendee list climbing. So clearly this is a very important topic, uh, and IFC and the Sustainable Banking Network are very pleased to be collaborating with the Development Bank of Southern Africa uh, for today's discussion. So we will be tackling the topic of advancing environmental assessment in Africa. We will also be touching on the co uh, featuring the consultation on the upcoming development uh, DBSA handbook on environmental assessment legislation in sub-Saharan Africa. This is the fourth edition of the handbook and it is ex much expanded from previous editions. It's always also being released at a time when sustainable finance uh, the environmental and social practices of financial institutions, as well as cross-cutting collaboration with other parts of the market, including financial sector regulators, developers, civil society, government authorities, is becoming more and more important. In this context, the reason for the involvement of the Sustainable Banking Network is quite important. So the Sustainable Banking Network is an IFC-facilitated platform that enables knowledge sharing amongst financial sector regulators in emerging markets. The network now represents 41 members, member countries, and approximately 43 trillion US dollars in banking assets under management. This is about 86% of banking assets in emerging markets. These regulators and banking associations that have joined the sustainable banking network are looking to learn from each other in how to develop national enabling frameworks that promote not only better risk management by the financial sector, but also identification of opportunities to add value through the way that capital is allocated. So seeking projects that have better environmental contributions and better social contributions. And what we're seeing is that the role of financial sector regulators is very important to fill a gap that has currently existed. In many cases, it is ministries of environment that set the tone in terms of legislation, and it is environmental and social practitioners that do a lot of the on the ground implementation on behalf of financial institutions. As we know, financial institutions have played an uh, increasingly stronger role and have been strengthening their standards in how they influence how environmental assessment is done. But now with financial sector regulators joining the dialogue, joining the practice, we see an opportunity to go beyond legislation. And so we're very we're thrilled uh, to also be featuring a contribution from the steering committee of the Ghana Sustainable Banking Principles today. We'll be talking about the role that the Central Bank of Ghana is playing in that respect. So environmental assessment is also expanding to include other topics. And we'll be hearing from the author of the handbook, Bryony Wormsley, He's a consultant to DBSA, but also director of the Southern African Institute for Environmental Assessment. She'll be talking to us a little bit later about the handbook, how it was put together, um, and the lessons learned and the opportunities for, for expanding this work in, in Africa. But firstly, I would like to invite uh, the Development Bank of Southern Africa, represented by Libby Dreyer, Head of Environmental Social Sustainability at DBSA to kick us off with some opening remarks on the reason for this handbook, the importance of this work, and the work that DBSA is doing to promote stronger standards of environmental assessment in Africa. So Libby, over to you. Okay, while we're waiting for Libby to share her slides, um, I'm going to read a little bit of her bio. I'd also like to uh, draw your attention to the fact that my colleague Tomas, uh, who supports the Sustainable Banking Network Secretariat, will be sharing additional information uh, through the chat, and uh, you, you can, you're also welcome to ask us questions in that respect. All right, Libby, do we have you on the line? Good afternoon, everybody. It's indeed a pleasure to be joining in this webinar this afternoon and to be uh, partnering with all of the participants here today. Just a few brief words, firstly, about the DBSA. Uh, we are an infrastructure development finance institution operating in Africa. Our main shareholder, our only shareholder, is the government of South Africa. Uh, we have a mandate to uh, work with our national, continental and global development policies 
in unlocking um, the uh, South African government's interest in uh, development financing on the continent. We work very closely with both public and private sector institutions to unlock uh, a sustainable in, uh, a, a infrastructure investment opportunities and solutions. And we work across the infrastructure uh, the investment value chain from planning, preparing, financing, building and maintaining. And um, undertaking responsible environmental and social governance practices in all our infrastructure financing uh, um, activities is key to our work. In doing so, we hope to adopt best practice in, uh, and approaches and tools in all of our activities. In terms of our ESG offering, um, we focus on three core activities, uh, building a, su a sustainable um, investment portfolio, financing sustainable, uh, financing uh, sustainable projects, and building effective partnerships for sustainability. And it's for this reason that we were very excited with a, a opportunity to support the development of the African, the, uh, the latest version of the African Environmental Assessment Legislation Handbook. We feel that this handbook is an essential tool to inform both DBSA work and that of our sustainability uh, uh, partners and practitioners in Africa. Um, regular updates of the publication enables ESG practitioners on the continent to keep abreast of evolving legislation, and it encourages us to adopt best practice both within DBSA and by our sustainable development partners. In terms of uh, best practice approaches, we really wanted to highlight four key issues. The first is that of the real need to protect our assets, our environmental and social assets um, on the continent, and to understand the importance of ESG practitioners in doing this. We believe that we need to acknowledge firstly the, our common ownership of these immense resources, secondly, to recognize the value of these assets, and thirdly, understand the importance of managing the assets for the common good of us all. And we do believe that a systems approach, it, it, by adopting a systems approach to do this, we, we really are able to um, embed effective environmental and social assessment um, in development practices. Secondly, we feel that the SDGs are a really critical tool to assist in addressing the key developmental challenges on the continent. And there, uh, um, environmental and social practice can play a key role in addressing uh, um, the needs of people in terms of integrated development, supporting effective grievance, grievance address and, 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 and people's voices, and most importantly, uh, bringing gender forward uh, into, into the de development discourse and understanding develop, uh, gender as, as critical to, to development. Secondly, ensuring effective resourcing uh, um, to um, maintain our natural resources and thereby and ensure that effective transparency in decision making assists this. Um, thirdly, looking at, uh, at uh, um, addressing the key problems um, of, of fossil fuel dependency on the, on the continent and how we are able to address the challenge of, of a development now greening later approach, um, which, which really does lock us into sustainable, uh, unsustainable development outcomes. Uh, effective resourcing to support oversight uh, of our e e and ESG practices on the continent is, is critical as is uh, effective collaboration and knowledge sharing. Pivoting from uh, uh, in, uh, impact assessment to unlock transformational impact is really key if we're wanting to make the transformational change that is necessary to ensure a, a, a sustainable low carbon future for us. And in this regard, there are four key areas that we believe are, are important going forward. 
Firstly, increasingly, financing institutions are beginning to recognize the importance of a finance, providing adequate finance to address biodiversity, and ESG practitioners in this regard play a critical role. The second is that climate financing uh, and this, this global scaling up of climate financing has opened new doors um, which, uh, which require project sponsors to implement responsible uh, uh, ESG practices. And in that regard, opens new, uh, new doors for uh, responsible investment and responsible projects. Thirdly, that of technology advances in infrastructure solutioning opening the way for greener and more sustainable infrastructure. But recognizing uh, the, that technology and built infrastructure on its own is not a panacea to our development solution. And in this regard, effective project implementation is, is really key. And here the need to pursue environmental judge, uh, uh, justice um, supported by adequate uh, and effective pre Pre, prior and informed consent at the project level, as well as ensuring appropriate financing to address environmental and social externality. Those of us working in the finance sector are often faced with the challenge that we are told, oh, that, those, health, those health impacts or those um, gender impacts cannot be addressed by the project. We have to work together to look at what are the appropriate financing tools with, uh, um, to uh, 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 finance and address environmental and, exter uh, and social ex externality. And lastly, we need to be very aware of the threats to achieving sustainability. And how do we, as development practitioners, address these threats? The, the ongoing challenge of poor quality of environmental and social impact assessment and the, and the role of the public in playing an effective oversight role in this is, is really key. Finding appropriate allocation to address and price for sustainability is, is critical. Addressing capacity constraints, both within the public and private sector, to ensure effective ESG practices. Addressing uh, regulatory overs oversight of, of development of, of development, and how do financiers play a role in effective regulatory uh, oversight is also a factor to be addressed. And then, very importantly, it's an issue that we face in the post-COVID uh, um, economic recovery, that of balancing competing development priorities. How does one balance goals, priorities, and solutions to ensure that our, our, our goal of a just and equitable low-carbon transition is achieved? And very, very importantly, we cannot achieve green unless we address inequality, poverty, and unemployment. And in that regard, building a sufficient pool of green projects that can affect, that can support transformation to an equitable future is critical for all. And it's for all of these reasons that DBSA has partnered with the Southern African Institute for Environmental Assessment to support the um, publication of the latest uh, version of the African Environmental uh, Assessment Legislation Handbook. On our website and, and, and the link provided, you will see um, where you can get the draft, which is now out for consultation. We encourage all of you who are participating in this webinar today to send in your comments, make suggestions in terms of corrections and additions to this, this handbook. It is only together that we will build and ensure an effective uh, product for all of us. Um, this uh, 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 will be open, this process will be open until the 29th of January, and we look forward to your comments. Fantastic, thank you so much, Libby. Um, I think you've done a great job contextualizing how important environmental assessment has now become and how critical it is to keep it fresh and evolving as these new trends come to the fore. I think one of the things that struck me is 
the, the themes around trans uh, boundary impacts and, and also how important human rights is becoming uh, with the guiding principles on business and human rights, providing much more structure in terms of what's expected. So next, we, we're moving on to uh, Mr. Hamand Lovu, who is ESG manager for Sub-Saharan Africa and Middle East and North Africa for IFC. As many of you will know, IFC was one of the first, if not the first, financial and international financial institution to adopt strong standards of sustainability performance. And Hama will be talking a little bit more about how those evolved. But they've now become used as a benchmark globally. And it's the reason why IFC was invited by financial sector regulators and banking associations to assist in developing, enabling regulations, policies, and national roadmaps that go beyond just legislation and encourage aspiration to uh, good practice, building capacity, um, allowing stakeholders within the value chain to connect with each other and collaborate more effectively. So just to give you a bit of background for those who don't know, IFC, the International Finance Corporation, is a member of the World Bank Group. It is the largest global development institution focused on the private sector in emerging markets. We work in more than 100 countries using our capital, expertise and influence to create markets and opportunities in developing countries. In fiscal year 2020, we invested $22 billion in private companies and financial institutions in developing countries, leveraging the power of the private sector to end extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity. I think one of the things I've appreciated about working with IFC uh, since 2005 is the dual mandate that the institution has. Everything is seen through the lens of both financial performance and development impact. So I'm uh, very proud to hand over to Mr. Hamad Ndlovu. Hamad is the, the Manager for Environment, Social and Governance Advice and Solutions for Middle East and Africa based in Nairobi, Kenya. He leads a team of 40 plus environmental social and governance specialists that provide investment support and advisory functions. He works closely with IFC investment teams and regional management to ensure that ESG risks and opportunities are managed effectively. Hama, I invite you to take the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, much appreciated the introduction. And also thank you very much to DBSA and, and SBL for the opportunity to speak at this event. Uh, I, I like the way that Libby ended the, uh, the opening remarks. We are in this together. I, I strongly believe in partnerships as well. Uh, so I will I will go through uh, our performance standards, just uh, the journey we've traveled so far, and challenges and some opportunities as well, and some emerging issues. So as 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 Louis pointed out, our ESG policies, guidelines, and tools are widely adopted as market standards and, and embedded in operational uh, uh, policies by many entities, corporations investors, financial intermediaries, stock exchanges, uh, regulators, and, and, and countries in some uh, some cases. Uh, this helps uh, emerging markets raise the ESG standards uh, and, and the level playing and, and, and create a level playing field. Our standards are used by over 100 commercial financial, financial institutions through the Equator principles. And, and, and now also, I think, uh, as, as, as Louis mentioned, uh, also as, as best practice guide for financial sector regulators that are developing national frameworks for sustainable finance, supported by the IFC uh, SBN. Uh, this uh, creates opportunities or uh, enhanced opportunities for DFIs and commercial uh, banks alike uh, to cooperate. Uh, it, it is through these ESG policies, guidelines, and, and tools that we help our clients understand and manage ESG risks in their projects. I, about 90% of our clients uh, believe that our ESG support is key in helping them reach their long-term business goals, uh, improve their relationships with stakeholders and local communities, and enhance their brand equity. As such, uh, we, we, we strongly believe that we have been a leader in setting uh, and, and implementing uh, standards for environmental and social sustainability in project finance uh, in emerging markets since 2006 when we first adopted our, our sustainability uh, framework. Could we, just pausing a little bit and asking ourselves, could we as IFC have achieved this, uh, uh, this leadership alone? 
No, absolutely not. We're not arrogant. We believe in strong and effective partnerships. This is something that I'll keep repeating throughout these uh, opening remarks. Uh, so in developing uh, our ESG uh, approaches, we undertook extensive global stakeholder consultation for both the 2006 and also the 2012 edition, editions of the, uh, of the performance standards. And, and, and since 2000, 2006, again, uh, on a regular basis, we, we convene community of learning events uh, where knowledge is shared, where we engage and we share experiences and, and we collaborate on thematic issues that uh, practitioners uh, and, and, and other financial institutions uh, face in, uh, in uh, what is trying to uh, achieve sustainable investment and also implementing the performance standards. We do uh, we do undertake periodic updates uh, to reflect evolution in good practice for sustainability and risk mitigation. And again, when we do that, we consult widely, as widely as we as we can. Now, uh, has it all been rosy and plain sailing uh, implementing uh, performance standards? Uh, absolutely not. We do face face some challenges, and and, and I'll go through a few of those that uh, that we come across particularly in this uh, in sub-Saharan Africa or the African continent. I myself have worked in 26 African countries as a practitioner and also uh, with IFC. It's interesting that uh, I think DBS and book covers 26 sub-Saharan African countries. What are, what are, are some of the challenges that we face? So uh, Libya again uh, mentioned this uh, low ENS capacity. At, at different levels, it could be at the regulator level, at the government level, at the market level, uh, and, and at client levels as well. As DBSAS and book uh, clearly identifies, countries do have a legal frameworks. They the enacted legal frameworks. However, oversight and enforcement vary across uh, different countries, uh, and this leads to so many other issues, uh, including varied quality of. ENS assessment. This again was on, on Libby's uh, uh, presentation. Gaps between host country requirements versus uh, self safeguard requirements or performance standard requirements. A limited ENS capacity of companies uh, and resources available to address uh, ENS issues. I will, uh, and, and in, in terms of capacity, just uh, to pause again, by comparison, IFC has over 200. ENS and G specialist tasked with ENS risk management in line with the sustainability uh, framework. And as, as Louise uh, pointed out, uh, ab about 40, 40 staff, but then we also have uh, consultants uh, are working in this region, sub Saharan Africa and, 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 or Middle East and Africa, to keep it short, and, and located in, in, in our four main hubs of uh, Johannesburg, Dakar, Nairobi. And, 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 and Cairo. Just uh, two quick examples to uh, to illustrate what, what I mean by uh, uh, low capacity. So one of my first, very first projects outside of the, of the mining space was uh, with an agri commodity trading company. Uh, and I remember then talking through our requirements and how that tied into the investment during the environment and social due diligence. The CEO of the company paused he was listening uh, uh, attentively, but midway through the conversation, uh, paused and said, Hammer, sorry to interrupt you, but I'm, I'm simply an agri commodities trader. How does this, uh, how does this relate to me? So the conversation immediately changed because I'd made assumptions that uh, sustainability or ENS is, a, is an issue that is uh, common to all uh, our, 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 our clients. Um, I'll, I'll skip the other. I'll skip the other example that I was going to share in the interest of time. Then limited support at the market level. So we we all work in these markets. There's scarcity of suitably qualified and experienced consultants of us. And I, I really want to emphasize suitably qualified and experienced because there are skills in each and every country on the continent. They vary, but it's it's it's, it's exposure to. Um, they may be using performance standards or going beyond uh, at national regulation requirements. So companies uh, struggle when we go into these markets to find uh, suitably qualified uh, and, and experienced consultants to help them deliver on, on, 
uh, sustainability requirements. And then uh, fragile and, and conflict affected situations. Um, out of the 39 that the World Bank list, 39 countries that the World Bank list for FY29, 20, 21, 20 of those are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And because I cover Middle East and Africa, 26 out of 39 of the countries are in Middle East and Africa of conflict uh, uh, affected situations. ESG issues have become even more pronounced, poor ENS practices, high contextual risk because of the volatility. So how, how then should we apply our standards in such uh, situations? Our approach is to stick to our standards, but, uh, but to, uh, to be flexible on timing, allowing more time, and, and then also committing more than just money, spending more time providing advice and holding our clients to deliver on, on, on these requirements. Where there are challenges, there are opportunities. So what are the opportunities? Opportunities, opportunities uh, exist at, 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 uh, through market level intervention initiatives. For instance, we have the uh, ESRM, Environmental and Social Risk Management, an advisory program that we at IFC established to strengthen capacity on environmental and social risk management by financial institutions in Africa. I've also mentioned intensive uh, client support, holding our clients, uh, though it can be resource intensive, but then we helping them to, to move from one step to the other. Knowledge products, e.g. the DBSA handbook and, 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 and regional ESG networks. This, this is uh, topical. We need these uh, knowledge products to bridge, again, bridge the gap between safeguard requirements and, and, and in country. This allows us to project, to, to process projects uh, much quicker and then get financing to the projects uh, where, where, where they are needed. There's also now opportunities for, 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 for companies uh, that, are, that, that are bridging that gap between uh, host country requirements and lender requirements. I'm keeping an eye on the, uh, on the clock here. And, and, and then one thing that I just wanted to point out is some of the major issues that, uh, that are coming through. Uh, for instance, how do we, how do we engage and, and, and communicate with civil uh, society? We at IIC value the role of uh, CSOs and NGOs and continue to look for opportunities to engage effectively within the confines of our sustainability framework. Again, this is because we believe in, uh, in the power of, of uh, uh, effective partnership. And, and, and doing things collectively. I'll skip some of the, the, the points that I had on emerging issues. But also, in, in, in closing out, I really want to make a call uh, for collaboration by all stakeholders, practitioners, civil society, financial institutions, and, and regulators to continue to build uh, broad-based capacity for undertaking a robust environmental assessment and incorporating it effectively into financial sector decision-making monitoring and disclosure. I uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to share these insights. I, I look forward to a robust and candid discussion and hope that this that, that doesn't turn out into just another talk show. We need action. Uh, the, the, the continent needs action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hama. And I think uh, from the questions that are coming in, I suspect the participants would have been happy with you speaking a little bit longer. Uh, I think you and Libby have both uh, started a discussion which requires a lot more detail for participants. There's so much required in terms of implementation, the detail, the devil is in the details. So we're seeing some questions coming through already about things like FPIC and, and, uh, and how that's with, whether that gets broadened, how does that get dealt with in African context? Also, how does the DBSA handbook compare with what's required in the IFC performance standards or what is the relationship between the two? And also, for instance, there was a very good question around how do you do uh, ESG assessments or index rating uh, for, some, for medium sized companies? So we often do uh, extensive ESG assessment for big, com big projects, and it's, it's not always easy to uh, tailor that for smaller businesses. But I, I invite you to stay on the, the, the line, Hama, and, and also if there are questions in the chat that you feel you would like to respond to, please go ahead and do that. Um, I know that our next speaker, uh, Bryoni, will also be able to uh, respond to some of these questions in her discussion and then also to give people uh, a heads up that we'll be hearing from Leanne Govinsami from the Center for Environmental Rights, 
who is very much speaking about, will be speaking about the role of civil society, uh, because we're seeing that the, the checks and balances, the multi, multiple perspectives in these things are essential, particularly because there's so much detail and work to be done. So with that, I'd like to invite Bryony to share her screen. Bryony is a consultant to the DBSA and compiler and lead author for the for the handbook on environmental assessment legislation in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, she has been involved in previous editions. I, I think Bryony's most impressive kind of claim to fame is that she has amassed more than 37 years of experience in environmental consulting. She has extensive experience in all aspects of EIA practice, including participating in man managing large EIAs for infrastructure and mining projects throughout Southern Africa, guiding and reviewing EIAs, due diligence audits and compliance monitoring, and conducting training in environmental management. She has authored several books and publications. She is also the director of the Southern African Institute for Environmental Assessment. So, Bryony, over to you. We look forward to hearing about what the handbook does, what it doesn't do, what more you think is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Louise, for the kind introduction. And before I go any further, I would like to thank my co-author for the handbook, Sheldon Hussman um, of SIA, um, and also the DBSA for funding uh, the development of this fourth edition. So without further ado, I'm going to just give a very brief history of the handbook and then provide a little bit of an overview of, over the years, what we've seen in terms of progress in environmental and social impact assessment legislation, and some of the challenges to, that still remain for environmental assessment law and policy, and then with some a few um, ideas of how we can take this forward. So starting right at the beginning, the Southern African Institute for Environmental Assessment was established in 2001 with World Bank seed funding, and it had a very explicit mandate, and that was to improve legal policy and institutional capacity in Southern Africa uh, through a variety of means. But the most important one for today's topic was the provision of tools to help improve environmental and social impact assessment practice, you know, guidelines, manuals, checklists, uh, methods, uh, and handbooks. And one of the very first um, handbooks that we developed was the Environmental Impact Assessment in Southern Africa handbook in 2003, uh, which was a very broad situation analysis of the environment and social conditions, and also um, a review of relevant legislation and institutions in terms of environmental impact assessment. Inspired by this, um, in 2007, the Development Bank um, provided the funding to develop the first edition of the handbook, which really focused solely on um, environmental assessment legislation, and this was in the SADC region. The idea was to develop this and update it every two years to keep pace with the rapidly evolving legal and institutional landscape. So in 2009, there was a web version published. And then in 2011, we did the work um, for updating that handbook, and it was published again by the DBSA um, in 2012. And now we come to 2020, after a small hiatus, um, with the, the latest version of the Environmental Assessment Handbook. Um, the handbook itself is a reference document. It is not an analytical um, assessment of the the practice of environmental legislation in the countries we covered. It is a reference tool, it's reference of the, the legal policy and institutional um, framework for environmental impact assessment legislation. And it also provides an overview of some of the other relevant environmental legislation. But it is, it is not an, an analytical text, it is a reference text. So from one of the questions that was asked already, I can answer that it does not um, address the performance standards. Um, it is a reflection of each country's in-country system. Um, so one would have to, in going into any country, you have to also comply with the national legislative system. So that's what it really addresses. And so over the years, from, the, um, from 2003, we had 13 countries in English only. Um, to the latest version in 2020, it's 26 country systems, and we have five chapters in French and English, and two chapters in Portuguese and English. And over the years, it's slowly expanded to include emerging issues, 
such as climate change, gender, health, workplace health and safety, certification of consultants, strategic environmental assessment and transboundary impacts. So every year we, we try to address new and emerging trends as they come out. So who uses the handbook? Well, lots of people use it, as I've been told. And um, it, it sits, the reference to it sits at the top of the, the Google search engine often. Um, and I have to say, I use it all the time. So if that, that's, I suppose, an endorsement. Whenever I'm about to travel to a country, I, I look at my, my handbook. Um, so where are we in terms of progress? Well, first of all, um, in the 2007 edition, there were still some countries in SADC who, who didn't have a dedicated Environmental and Social Impact Assessment Act. Um, but now all the countries, all um, 26 country systems analyzed for the latest edition, they all have a, have a standalone act. The situation regarding whether the environment is, is in its own standalone ministry or part of a broader ministry with conflicting mandates, for example, mining or energy, um, economic development. Um, there are still quite a lot of, of countries where um, the environmental ministry is housed within a broader ministry. And, and it, this does present some, some problems around independence and conflict of, conflict of interest. But what is pleasing is that there has been a, a growth um, in the intervening years since 2007 where the Environmental Authority Agency is, is being set up as a statutory separate entity reporting to a board, which does give it some more arm's length um, autonomy from the ministry within which it is housed. And so that, that's been a very pleasing development. And you can see there's been an in, um, increase from naught of the countries to 60, 46% in 2020. Another key topic, which um, I, I just pulled out, was looking at the role of public participation in, in ESIA. And best practice has it that public participation should happen both in scoping and the environmental impact assessment stages. So there's at least two um, interventions, if not more. And that has increased that the requirement, the mandatory requirement for public participation, only 27% of countries in 2007, and that's increased to 46% now. And there's been a decrease in country systems where there is only one public hearing after the ESIA report has been completed. So down from 33% to 11% now. Now that is, that is very much um, progress because to hold a public hearing after the EIA has been produced is, is way, way too late in the process. And it really means that the, any comments from the public and stakeholders um, has no meaningful value or adds no value to the ESIA itself. So that is, is some progress. Strategic environmental assessment, it's been in the law really um, for, for a while now, but where things have improved is that back in 2007, no, none of the countries looked at then had regulations and guidelines for SEA, and that's now increased to 35%. But this is still way, way too low. Um, SEA they can, can and should play a really important role in more sustainable um, planning. And finally, um, a lot of questions go on about the quality of environmental and social impact assessment practitioners. Um, and again, there's been some progress here where back in 2007, only 20% of the countries looked at, um, had a formal registration process, and that's improved to 55%. So these are just some of the indicators of practice, and it's, it's showing a, a, a slowly improving trend, um, but much, much more needs to be done. One of the issues is that 50% uh, of the countries have um, an environmental policy which is older than 20 years, and only 23% of countries have developed a new environmental policy in the last 10 years. So this, this means that environmental policies have really not kept up and kept pace with emerging issues as they come out. Um, while all countries um, in the 2020 handbook have ratified the United, uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, only 50%, that's only half of the countries, have a climate policy in place. And most of these policies post-date 
the environmental social impact assessment laws. So this means that climate change assessment are not a mandatory requirement in the ESIA as it stands at the moment. This is something that really one of the key emerging issues which um, the law um, is lagging behind um, the emerging issue. Um, when it comes to the policy, I should say. So when it comes to the, the laws, only 31% um, have a more recent, that's in the last 10 years, um, new act. So that means a lot of them, 69% um, are older than, than 2010. Um, so there is real scope for, for review and revision of these acts. And then a while ago, I did a, well, maybe a year or two ago, I did an assessment of sub-Saharan Africa. Of the 43 country systems I looked at there with, with an environmental impact assessment law, what was really shocking was that only 64% of them included the term social in the term environment. This is really worrying um, when we talk today in the 21st century, if we are still talking about an environment that comprises the biophysical environment and does not include the socio-economic, health, cultural and political environments in which we live. And this is a real problem. And in fact, even worse is that only 12% of those mentioned health as being part of the environmental milieu. So these are some areas where there are some real gaps which need to be improved in terms of the legislation. Now I'm going to just look at some of the challenges that face us these days. And one of them is when we look at life cycle impacts. You know, green energy, green growth, it, this is fantastic. And obviously we must be going in this direction if we want to meet um, the Paris Agreement goals. But if you start to dig around in something like the raw materials for solar PV panels, it starts to get a little bit messy. And here we have huge problems of child labor, human rights abuses, massive environmental destruction going on in the world, mining for the essential elements that go into making the solar PV panels. One of the worrying things is that most of these countries which produce these, these minerals for the panels are located in countries which have existing environmental and social safeguard systems and regulations. But clearly, they are not being implemented properly and they're not being enforced. And one of the conclusions from the Institutional Institute for Sustainable Futures, their report in 2019, was that going 100% renewable power means a lot of dirty mining. And that dirty means in every respect, from human rights, child labour, socio-economic and biophysical impacts. So we have to ask the question, you know, these countries do have environmental and social safeguard systems in place, but are they being applied um, all the time? And are they being applied throughout the whole project life cycle, which is even more important? So that we have to ask the question when we look at something like this, is how green is green energy? That is a very, very important question. Another challenge is how do we maximize um, socioeconomic benefits in a sustainable manner? Now we have a situation perhaps here in Uganda, the Albertine Rift Valley on the northwest border of Uganda, and it's got estimated reserves of 12 billion barrels of oil. Uh, it's enormous, it's enough to sustain production for the next 20 years. Um, and there's of course lots of other ancillary structures. And this could really transform the socio-economic landscape of Uganda and for the people of Uganda if, if it's used wisely um, and, and cautiously. And in fact, a, a strategic environmental assessment of this was done um, quite a long time before the exploration started. But how can we prevent things like this? This is a road right through the middle of the Murchison Falls National Park to have quicker access to the oil fields. So how can we maximize the socioeconomic benefits, but in a sustainable manner without causing massive um, um, other impacts on the environment? And in a situation like this, you have to ask, well, are the environmental and the social safeguards working at all to allow this sort of thing to happen? Another challenge, how do we address climate change? You have a situation of where town planning, infrastructure design and development, we've got to rethink completely how we develop and 
plan and zone our cities and towns and villages and how we build our, our infrastructure to make it much more resilient. The previous one in 50 year flood line is now no longer a one in 50 year flood line. It might be much bigger. So engineers and, and town planners must have a serious look at what's going on here. When it comes to, in this case, obviously Australia, bushfires, but in wider perspective, we need to consider our policies on, on our emissions, on our invasive species control, our land use management and so on, to make sure that we don't have the catastrophe that was witnessed in Australia last year. Coming closer to my home is in the Cape Town drought. This is one of the main water supply dams near Cape Town. And this is how resources were at the peak of the drought. But we have to say, is the way we use water still sustainable? Are we building large dams and more and more water resources like this and development of these water resources? Is this sustainable? Or should we relook at the way we, we use our natural resources? especially in, in the face of climate change. And the same too for sea level rise and coastal development. Then the question is, are environmental and social safeguards doing enough about climate change? And the final challenge I'd just like to raise is, and this is very close to my heart, is the increased use of strategic environmental assessment. This is um, construction of a large expressway, also in Uganda. I'm, I'm not picking on Uganda. This is, I've just been there a lot recently. Um, and this is one road of eight major expressways, which are, have been, are being, or about to be built in Kampala at this time. And not just big roads, but railway lines, port facilities, industrial estates, and so on and so forth all pretty much at the same time within the same municipal area. If ever there was a case for really good use of strategic environmental assessment, this really is it. And, and again, we have to ask do traditional environmental and social safeguards, in other words, the environmental impact assessment process, does it work in situations like this? Each one of these developments will have had an ESIA report. Each individual development finance institution will have reviewed it. There probably are dozens, multiple different financiers, each with differing environmental and social safeguard standards, all operating in the same space. And is this, is this tenable and is it viable and does it, does it result in improved outcomes or not? So we have to raise the question, you know, do these traditional systems work in situations like this. And this is not just confined to Kampala in Uganda, this is all over major cities of Africa. So to conclude, we need to update and revise um, legislation and policy, which is over 10, 15 years old, to bring it up to date to reflect all the emerging issues. Um, we need to continue to strengthen the capacity of the environmental authorities we, for so long, we have been front-ending and front-loading the ESIA process, and we've done far less on auditing of project implementation, enforcing permit conditions, and imposing penalties on non-compliance. So, in many cases, you can have a really good environmental and social impact assessment, but the outcomes are terrible because of the lack of follow-up. Climate change assessments should be mandatory large-scale projects and it must really address two main questions is the project resilient to climate change and how will the project contribute to achieving the paris agreement goals and then the increased use of strategic environmental assessment we've got to improve the legislation we've got to improve institutional capacity and we need to provide budgets for strategic environmental assessments to be done so as laws and policies continue to evolve, um, hopefully the environmental assessment handbook will be regularly updated to keep pace with the emerging laws and practice to transition to a more sustainable future. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you so much, Bryony. That was comprehensive and challenging. Um, uh, this, it clearly an enormous amount of work has gone into the various iterations of the handbook, and it's uh, it's gr really great for us to be able to share this type of resource with the financial sector regulators that are now 
also joining the conversation around environmental assessment. So now that we have a background on the handbook and the challenges from the perspective of development finance institutions like DBSA and the IFC, and thank you for all that are sending in their questions about those challenges, because we know uh, through IFC's engagement with the Creative Principles Banks, uh, through a community of learning, which is held every year, this is an ongoing learning journey, again, in terms of how to deal with the details, what works in emerging markets. But next, I would like to invite uh, Leanne Govansami from the uh, Center for Environmental Rights to bring us the civil society perspective. I think this has come up in almost all the presentations that the role of civil society is incredibly crucial. Um, civil society have contributed to the development of standards like the IFC performance standards for environmental and social sustainability. Uh, but then in terms of implementation of those standards, implementation of legislation, they provide a very important watchdog role, activist role, advocate role. So the Center for Environmental Rights is an, the, a group of activist lawyers who work with communities and civil society organizations in South Africa to realize their constitutional right to a healthy environment. CR advocates and litigates for environmental justice, so they tackle some of the really tough issues and the tough projects. They also seek a just, equitable, compassionate society which is resilient, celebrates diversity, and respects the interdependence between people and the environment. So we're very lucky to have Ms. Leanne Govensami to hit with us today, Program Head, Corporate Accountability and Transparency at CER. She is a human rights lawyer working towards social and environmental justice. And she is one of the team members driving the, uh, a recent report by CER in collaboration with the Fair Finance International Initiative to look at the policies of development finance institutions when it comes to implementation of environmental and social governance standards, including climate change and human rights. So Leanne is going to talk to us a little bit today about what they learned through those studies and what challenges CER sees in terms of improving environmental assessment in Africa. So Leanne, over to you. Thanks, Louise. Um, I hope that um, you're able to see my presentation. Um, it doesn't seem to. It's showing up on our side. I think you can switch it to presentation mode uh, and then we'll be able to see the full slides. Okay, let me try. So I've tried it. Um, <laughs> it doesn't seem to be working, but. If we're struggling, also... we can, uh, Sahali or Tomas can share it on your behalf, if that works for you. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. All right, so let's switch to Holly and as presenter. And then uh, in the meantime, Leanne, feel free to go ahead and, and start speaking. Okay, great. Um, so good day, everyone. Um, it's <clears throat> really great to be able to join you today. Um, and a huge thank you to the organizers for arranging this really important discussion. Um, a little bit about the CER. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization um, and law clinic based in Cape Town and Johannesburg. We are activist lawyers who help communities and civil society organizations in South Africa realize our constitutional right to a healthy environment by advocating and litigating for environmental justice. So first, I'd really like to say um, well done to all those who have worked on the handbook. Um, it is so crucial that the legal requirements for environmental assessment are followed closely so that all projects which have been presented for financing are subject to rigorous due diligence and decision making. Um, proper due diligence on the part of financial institutions in particular, an incredible uh, or uh, such an important aspect of in, in ensuring sustainable finance. However, it's also important to note that environmental assessments can only tell one part of the story and that um, developmental mandates coming from national governments, rapidly changing international frameworks and guidelines, as well as reputational and litigious risks um, due to particular uh, project finance can all impact on decision making processes. Um, as well as the approaches being take, taken by DFIs. Importantly, and I think this is a kind of common uh, theme in terms of what people have been discussing, financial institutions 
are needing to go beyond environmental assessment and engage in best practices, which may not be legally required. Um, so where legislative requirements are, for example, not being enforced, which Brioni has spoken to, um, I think DFIs have a major role to, to play in engaging in best practices. So I want to start off firstly by reflecting from a civil society, um, or I want to be able to reflect from a civil society perspective on the questions posed by the organizers, which is what are the emerging priorities for environmental assessment and decision making? And before I go into those priorities, I really want to say a little bit about the context that we're in. So if we look at, um, you know, development finance institutions across the world and even regulators and governments um, almost all would subscribe to the sustainable development goals and what's really interesting is that the sdgs themselves and the 2030 agenda for sustainable development are being rapidly redefined in particular through un resolutions that deal with what is termed harmony with nature and a July 2020 report um, entitled Harmony with Nature, uh, the report of the Secretary General, um, has the following to say on, on the, the, the agenda for sustainable development. And he says, there's got to be a paradigm shift from a human-centered to an earth-centered society in the implementation of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. Um, over the past decade, a mosaic of developments in ecological economics has emerged in a number of countries linking planetary health and well-being. And quite, I think, um, you know, contentiously or, or, or perhaps something that, you know, um, a lot of different institutions would grapple with, it is stated that alternatives to gross domestic product as a measure of well-being are entering policy arenas at various levels of government and advances in the field of ecological economics are being made in various countries. So I think that those are really interesting statements to kind of set the scene for kind of four um, uh, kind of emerging priorities that I want to discuss. So on transparency and disclosure, um, there are a number of initiatives that go over and above legislative requirements, which assess how financial institutions and regulators are being more transparent, providing full and detailed information on projects so as to enable proper oversight. Um, an example that I'll use is that the Center for Environmental Rights has used disclosure as a means to understand, illustrate, the environmental and climate risks facing corporations and the impact of their operations on affected communities and on the environment. Our full disclosure series of reports, and I've, and I've got the link into the, into the PowerPoint, um, assesses the public disclosures of South African banks and companies. And we consider um, or report raise critical questions about how major South African corporations and banks are preparing for a low carbon e economy and how such preparation will give some companies a competitive advantage over others. We relied on the um, Financial Stability Board's Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures and we assessed climate-related disclosures of 15 companies, the extent to which these companies report on climate change, the quality of disclosures and importantly we assist the five major banks in South Africa as well. So this gives you a sense of how civil society is assessing disclosure, um, how civil society is um, working together, both, both with community partners as well, to demand better transparency so as to enable proper oversight. Um, another report that we have um, launched earlier this year was our financing fairly report and this kind of builds on transparency and disclosure and takes us into whether there are binding commitments from various financial institutions in respect of ensuring that South Africa is able to meet its international climate obligations and ensure just transition 
And this report focused on the policies that DFIs have in respect of addressing climate change, environmental protection, um, and there were various thematic areas, including gender, that were assessed. And it found that there were a number of DFIs that did not have policies or their policies were inadequate. And we are actively engaging with such DFIs to understand the difficulties that they face and to encourage change and to illustrate the best practices that are being used by peers around the world. Um, one of the important things that emerged from our discussion uh, with DFIs around our financing failure report was that they face a particular difficulty in respect of following national policy and development mandates that can be at odds with environmental protection or advancing climate change best practice or, or advancing particular policies um, to, 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 towards a low carbon economy. And so, so I really want to kind of um, raise this issue because I think it's an incredibly important one. Because in as much as a DFI can make public commitments to in their climate change policies or, 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 or otherwise in order to say, look, we want to ensure sustainable development. We want to um, ensure that, that there are particular constitutional imperatives that are born in mind as well. They also fundamentally have a development mandate. Um, and, and what we are now seeing is that civil society is engaging with um, institutions like the National Treasury, uh, particular departments that are responsible uh, for DFIs and are engaging with public policies around what development should look like. Um, and, and this, I think, is incredibly important because it kind of presents two questions. The one is what civil society is doing to engage with public policy so as to, in, to change what development means. And secondly, how can development finance institutions push back on particular um, ideas of what development is and impose conditions and projects, right? Is there a possibility for DFIs to offer alternatives to traditional modes of development um, and, and, and impose conditions, for example? And I want to kind of uh, finalize my presentation with a, a bit of a reflection on two projects um, that have that the CR has has dealt with. The first is um, a, a coal fired power plant which has not gone ahead because civil society took um, government to court over the particular coal plant. And th this is the case of Taba Metsi. And in this case, firstly, the courts themselves have said that climate change imperatives must be borne in mind when deciding on new coal developments. Um, and, and this is incredibly important because the result of the, the, the court has meant that the environmental authorization has now been set aside and that all the financing that had originally been poured into this project was gradually pulled out because there was massive both financial, reputational and legal risk in going ahead with particular financing. And the second is, um, the second example I want to use is a 3,300 megawatt project that is being planned. Um, it's a special, in, in the special econo economic zone in Limpopo and in the Limpopo province in South Africa. And here, this particular project although it would create a number of jobs, would also have massive climate and water impacts, negative impacts. And there has been strong civil society resistance. So the question remains, um, will DFIs continue to finance this project? Will it risk um, uh, legal interventions, reputational harm, and most importantly, the climate change impacts as a result of this, of this project? Um, and so I leave you with these questions um, and, and I hope uh, to engage with you further during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne. That was great. Uh, I think this is 
it's it's actually great to see how much detailed work the civil society is able to do to be able to provide technical guidance to DFIs. I think every, many financial institutions are still on a learning journey, building up systems. IFC has been doing this since the 1990s and continues to learn and improve. So as Hamas said, it's not perfect, but it's, a con it's an ongoing journey. So now I have the, the privilege of inviting our next speaker, Mr. Musa Sala, who is the chair of the Ghana Sustainable Banking Principles Steering Committee. From 10 founding countries to uh, 41 emerging markets, and we have approximately 26 of those emerging markets that have introduced policies or frameworks to promote sustainable finance. And when we talk about sustainable finance, as a reminder of what I said at the beginning, it's an overarching umbrella concept that we use for the different pillars of environmental and social risk management, as well as driving capital to uh, projects that have better environmental and social benefits, including green sectors and uh, socially beneficial sectors. In our ongoing work through SBN, we are also seeing that climate risk management is emerging as a pillar of its own. And in our uh, biennial benchmarking of countries, which will happen again in 2021, we'll be looking specifically at how climate change is being incorporated. But in the case of Ghana and uh, today's speaker, Ghana joined the Sustainable Banking Network in 2016. It started its journey on sustainable banking in 2015 with the in establishment of the Sustainable Banking Principles Committee. IFC has been part of that journey from the outset and with it, through a cooperation agreement with the Bank of Ghana, the environmental and social risk management uh, program for Ghana has worked with uh, Central Bank of Ghana as well as other Ghanaian partners, including the Environmental Protection Agency, the Ghana Association of Bankers, to provide technical guidance in the drafting of a set of sustainable banking principles and also preparing the banking sector to implement them. So the principles after a comprehensive stakeholder engagement process were launched in November 29. And Musa will tell us a little bit more about that journey. And I will paste the principles into the chat so that you can see uh, what they include. And several sector guidelines have also been developed. So this is the kind of leadership and uh, multi-stakeholder engagement that uh, SBN members are taking, the financial sector regulators and the banking associations. And engaging and contributing to this particular dialogue is one of the exciting next steps uh, for the SBN network. So Musa, I would like to hand over to you. Musa is the group manager and head of environmental and sustainability at EcoBank Transnational Incorporated. Uh, and he is also part of the chair of the Ghana Sustainable Bank Principal Steering Committee. Musa, over to you. Thank you, Louise, for having me. And then uh, thank you so much to, for the, to the organizers of today's event. And I also thank the Development Bank of Southern Africa for extending the coverage of this particular edition of the environmental assessment legislation to other countries outside South Africa or outside Southern Africa. I think it is a very good opportunity to facilitate knowledge exchange and sharing of information on a common objective. And also, I thank um, IFC for all the support they have been giving to the Ghana Sustainable Banking Steering Committee during the development of the Ghana Sustainable Banking Principle, as well as implementation phase, work, which we are now embarking on. I will introduce uh, me by Louis. Thank you. I'm going to be making an intervention from two. I'm going to make an intervention on the environmental assessment handbook that is being launched from two angles. I'm going to be talking about the current legislation practices capacity related to environmental assessment in Africa. While at the same time, too, I'm going to be talking about the need to strengthen environmental assessment um, in the financial institution. I'm going to be talking about the need to strengthen environmental assessment to help the financial institution respond to new sustainable finance expectation of financial regulators. Then I'm going to be focusing my conversation mostly from the Ghana perspective, citing an example on the success journey Ghana Sustainable Banking Principle has embarked on thus far. In that regard, um, let me start by giving a, a general overview of Chapter 11 of the draft. Um, this DSD, sorry, Development Bank of DDSA Environmental Assessment Handbook. 
I noticed from the chapter 11, which focused mainly on Ghana, that all the constitutional informations, as well as the policy and governance framework under the Ministry of Environment, Science, and Te Science Technology and Innovation have been adequately captured. The chapter also captures some of the operational and compliance framework, which inspired the development of environmental assessment regulation, which include the environmental impact assessment, the environmental management plan, as well as the process for taking decision or making an appeal where it is necessary. In addition to the contents of the draft chapter 11 of the over of the handbook, other national policy and, and constitutional acts relevant to the work of environmental protection agency in Ghana. And as I mentioned, environmental protection agency is the environmental regula regulatory authority in the country. So, this other national policy include the Energy Commission, because we could not talk about environment assessment without also looking at resource efficiency, i.e. energy consumption, energy utilization, and the development of energy resources. In the same sense, too, we also look at the Hazardous and Electronic Waste Control and Management Act, also in Ghana. Then we look beyond the Act and Act of Parliament, is also the need to also look at the national environmental policy which was formulated in 2012, as well as the National Climate Change Policy, which was also developed in 2013. I will talk about the content of the document, that is the chapter 11 of the draft handbook. I noted that uh, page 22, sec uh, subsection 11.6.4.6, alluded to the fact that, yes, Environmental Protection Agency in Ghana is not specifically required in the act or regulation to carry out monitoring and inspection of projects upon issuance of the environmental permit. While this is correct as it has been captured, I would like to also make um, an anecdote that the Environmental Protection Agency in Ghana is currently working on strengthening its inspectorate and monitoring capability. Some of the efforts the EPA is putting in place to achieve this include amending its Establishing Act 490, as well as the Environmental Regulatory Act, that's uh, Legislative Instruments 1652, which borders on environmental impact assessment. In addition to this, a number of speakers actually alluded to the fact that inadequate capability in terms of the uh, capacity and training is one factor that is impeding effective implementation of environmental assessment in the region. I see mentioning it as well as other speakers as well. In that regard, Environmental Protection Agency in Ghana is what is uh, as initiated a directive to hire more staff so as to supplement its staff strength and cater for the emerging responsibilities which the agency is now facing including the need to carry out a more frequent inspection and compliance monitoring visit to the project site upon issuance of the environmental permit. In addition to this too, in addition to the capacity building, the, company, the agency is also embarking on an awareness mechanism so as to raise the awareness and to create information, not information and knowledge management among the general stakeholder in the country. So this gives the observation I made regarding the chapter 11 on, on Ghana in the assessment and book to be launched now. But I will talk about the chapter 11. It is important as, as it has been alluded by other speakers that they need, to, uh, it, they need to work together in a collaborative partnership towards achieving a better and sound environment and social, uh, and social need are critical. And in so doing, Ghana and in Ghana, under the leadership of Bank of Ghana, and a collaborative activity of Bank of Ghana, Environmental Protection Agency, and the Ghana Association of Bankers, we realized that yes, they need to complement the work of Environmental Protection Agency on environment is critical. From the financial perspective, we've identified that but a number of global mega trends, i.e., sustainability, climate change, disaster reduction, water scarcity, among others that have been mentioned earlier on by other speakers, also have the potential to impact our business and an operation in the financial institution. 
If we take climate change, for instance, by rising temperature and the increasing rainfall, rainfall, we lead to severe flooding, which can then damage the property the bank has, as well as the property the bank is holding in collateral. This will then exacerbate the case of liability risk. It can also impact, it can also impact on the macro prudential issues, such as agriculture, as well as food production, thereby leading to increasing inflation and then necessitating or escalating, uh, escalating credit risk. Having said this, the importance of collaboration between financial institutions as well as Environmental Protection Agency and the financial regulator in charting forward a corporate sustainability stewardship so as environmental effectiveness is critical. And thankfully, at the global level, we have seen a number of countries coming out with plans to accelerate their climate mitigation as well as adaptation measures towards carbon neutral in September. We know that China announced that it plans to achieve carbon neutral by 2060. Then European Union and Japan, among others, also come up with a plan to achieve carbon neutral by 2050. Of course, the United Kingdom came up with a more ambitious plan to achieve this by 2040. And the emerging markets, including Ghana, as well as other developing countries, through the nationally determined contribution, countries are putting measures to also reduce their emission quota. But this does not leave the but this does not leave the private sector out of it. It requires a concerted effort of the private sector, the public sector, as well as the civil society. In this regard, this private sector, talking in terms of the financial institution in Ghana, are already making effort to ameliorate their impact on the environment. Of course, as a financial institution practitioner. We do not carry out and we do not impact significantly on the aesthetic quality of the environment and social need. But through the transaction that we are financing, because we have the financial powerhouse to make transactions, to make projects happen. In this regard, a number of tools are being deployed. This includes Climate and Environmental Social Risk Initiative, which is one of the tools that we have adopted um, we have adopted and adapted from the ISC performance standard. Also to talk about the sustainable finance, making sure that yes, our facility are supporting activity that are in line with environmental friendliness and social acceptability. And of course, we are also providing incentives to the institution or to some of our clients that they are pursuing their activity in an environmentally friendly and social acceptable manner. Beyond this, we've also carried out a number of the solar installation to retrofit energy generation and to reduce emission from fossil fuel power. They gain to, when it comes to the sustainable transportation, the number of banks in Ghana, banks in Ghana have invested significantly in the urban mass transport so as to reduce the emission and to also reduce vehicular congestion on our road. When it comes to the agriculture and afforestation, banks in Ghana are also in this regard, also making their contribution. Similar to the bank's activity in the agriculture, the bank are also supporting energy efficiency building when it comes to the real estate and construction activity. So we believe this is important, and that is why we continue to call for collaboration among the, uh, the regulator, the, um, the banking industry, as well as the environmental regulator in that regard. This collaboration that we've been calling for has led to the development of Ghana sustainable banking principle. The principle, as Louis said, was developed by collaborative initiative of the Bank of Ghana, Ghana Association of Bankers, Ghana Environmental Protection Agency, with technical support and guidance from IFC, as well as consulting support from the PWC. The Ghana sustainable banking principle comprises of several main activities. The first one being on the need to identify, measure, mitigate, and monitor environmental and social risk. But it does not only limit the principle one on risk, uh, risk criteria. It also gives us the opportunity to also find a way to translate this risk into opportunity, either through sustainable business or sustainable finance initiative. The second principle is on the need to promote good environmental and social and governance practices in banks' internal business operation. In other words, it is important for the bank to also explore 
creative way of reducing their own carbon footprint and carbon emission within the bank. This includes how they could reduce the number of paper that they are using and how they could also ensure that some of their buildings are also being carried out in a way that reduces energy consumption. The principal theory talk about the need to promote corporate governance and ethical standards. With trust, well, trust is important in the business that we do as a financial institution. It is the trust that enables the, the, our client, the depositor, to put their money in us for us to transact our business. While this is critical, in terms of the governance too, it is equally important to ensure that our clients are abiding with the necessary regulation and complying with the standard that has been set. For instance, if we are to pick institutions such as the extractive industry, how well are our extractive industry clients, be it in gold mining or other minerals, are complying with the World Bank Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative? And how well are they also meeting the goal set out by the Minerals Commission Ghana, which is a regulatory body set up to, to, um, to monitor compliance when it comes to the mining sector in Ghana? In the same sense, too, it is equally important to also look at the issue of how can we promote gender activity through the financial muscles of the banking institution in Ghana, working with other stakeholders like the Ministry of uh, Women and Gender. Similarly, promoting financial inclusion is critical so as to facilitate access to finance. Access to finance for the people in the rural area as well as peri-urban and urban centre. But it is even more critical to promote access to financing, either through digital banking channel or through savings and micro microfinance initiative for people who are living in the Sahelian and the Savannah region, to which due to the harsh climatic condition and the population dispersed settlement, it becomes difficult for them to have access to the conventional banking services. So it is important for the bank to come out with the initiative to promote financial inclusion. In the same sense too, Promoting resource efficiency and sustainable consumption and production is equally important. How do we ensure that the water, energy, as well as the waste generation are reduced to the barest minimum? And the way energy is being utilized, how can we ensure that energy is utilized in a manner that is very efficient? Beyond the efficiency, it's also important to explore renewable energy as much as possible when, where applicable. But the last principle which is on reporting is critical. As all of you bear with me, expectation without inspection could lead to a failure or a disappointment. So just because Bank of Ghana, Ghana Association of Bankers and Environmental Protection Agencies have developed the principle, and the principle have been endorsed by all the CEOs and managing directors of banks in Ghana. And the principle was also launched in November 2019 by our vice president in Ghana. This means it is important for us to see how banks are actually implementing this initiative. So, reporting is crucial. Reporting in a manner that discloses and in a, in a manner that discloses the implementation criteria and the achievement being made in a transparent manner. So, this gives the framework and overview of Ghana's sustainable banking principle. Having launched the principle, having presented the overview of the principle, the principle also needs are being applied the principles are being applied in five critical sectors that are sensitive to the environmental and social standard these sectors are agriculture and forestry mining and oil and gas construction and real estate power and energy as well as manufacturing it is important to note in 2006 the world bank reported that due to two degree rate of deforestation in ghana it was leading, it was causing disproportionate 10% loss of GDP. So that gives the importance of agriculture. Either you want to uh, forestry and agriculture. Either you want to look look at it in terms of the in other if you want to look at it in terms of the impact on the water, water, water supply, or you want to look at it in terms of the urbanization. Agri is important, and so also mining, so also construction and real estate, as well as power generation, distribution, and transmission. Of course, manufacturing cannot undermine the importance when it comes to discussion about the economic growth. In, light, in line with the eligible sector, it is equally important to note that from 2012, sorry, from 2019, when the policy was, when the principle was launched, a number of initiatives have been, uh, been, been carried out. 
This includes the need to develop a monitoring guideline and reporting template, which will be used by the Bank of Ghana in monitoring the, uh, the monitoring and the collating reporting from the banks on how they are implementing the principle. In the same sense, too, we realize that there is no level playing field when it comes to the capacity capacity in the for the implementation of Ghana sustainable banking principle. I see gentlemen talked about it earlier on. It is important to build capacity, but it is equally important to build capacity in a manner that is receptive and in a manner that will help us to achieve our common goal. In this regard, the Bank of Ghana Sustainable Banking Steering Committee is working with ISC as well as other key stakeholders in the learning and development in Ghana, including the National Banking College as well as Chartered Institute of Banking. Of course, environmental protection agencies also involved in designing a series of learning and development training, which are based on the, the basic training on environmental and social management system, the intermediate, intermediate training on the environmental and social management system and climate issues, and the last stage, which will be the advanced in how to incorporate environmental sustainability in the policy program and plan. And this is what is going to reflect on how banks will be able to identify and manage environmental and social issues related to strategic government activity. In other words, the final stage will be integrated for, for strategic environmental analysis or strategic environmental assessment. If talking about the training too, it is equally important to raise awareness for alignment and buy-in of the critical stakeholder outside the banking industry. Then we felt it's equally important to continue to build the structure within the banks in terms of the policy development within the bank, in terms of the engaging the board and the board of directors of banks, and then also making sure that the understanding of sustainability or sustainable banking principle tenant is equally or is equally understood within the institution. Of course, we cannot talk about the establishment and without talking about the continuous engagement. We have developed the policy in, and the policy has been launched in 2019. This is just the first thing because this policy will be subjected to frequent renewal as the emerging situation occurs. So this gives the roadmap that we are looking at for the implementation of Ghana sustainable banking principle. Having said that, in conclusion, we continue to learn and then we continue to poise ourselves for development further. In doing so, what we have seen so far with the support from ISC and other key stakeholders, the collaborative partnership of the Bank of Ghana, Environmental Protection Agency, and Ghana Association of Bankers on the development of social banking principle has created a desired value addition for the environmental assessment in Ghana. So with our work in the financial institution, we are complementing the work of environmental, making sure that yes, all our clients in an environment operating in an environmental and social sensitive sector obtain environmental permit or environmental clearance from EPA before we could issue any facility in that regard. Evidently, what we can conclude here is that the strategic integration of economic, social, and environmental factor in decision making of banks is helping to ameliorate economic imbalance and then also helping to alleviate poverty and social inequality. While at the same time, too, it is contributing to pursue or to reduce environmental pollution, while at the same time to addressing the climate, the menace of climate change. It is on this note, ladies and gentlemen, that I would like to sign off and I'll be happy to interact with you in the question and answer period. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. So we've reached the end of our uh, webinar today. Let me see if I can invite you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so we've had very rich presentations from all our speakers. I want to thank them uh, for the effort that they put in and also helping to bring our participants up to speed with the very exciting sh shift that's happened with financial sector regulators becoming much more involved in environmental assessment. What I think is really great is that they're seeing this for, as an issue of financial stability, uh, of risk in the financial sector, as well as value in the financial sector as Musa explained. And as financial sector regulators uh, become more active in how they supervise financial institutions, they won't just be looking at le le uh, le legal compliance. They'll be looking at the ways in which having a green portfolio, a por portfolio where ESG is integrated in terms of risk management, as well as green loans, 
will actually en enable financial institutions to perform better and contribute to the economy. So I think in that context, uh, I'd like to congratulate the Development Bank of Southern Africa for pushing forward with the update of the handbook at such an important time, to Bryony and the other authors for making sure that the handbook keeps pace with how legislation is changing and also continues to challenge us in terms of what needs to be done going forward. And then to Lian and the Center for Environmental Rights and other civil society activists and advocates who are doing such good work to keep the development finance institutions on their toes, making sure that policies are fit for purpose are being implemented and that legislation uh, is, is complied with and continues to involve. So we're, we're at five, just five minutes over time. So I'm going to close off our webinar. Thank you to DBSA for the opportunity for us to co-host with you. It's been uh, a privilege and we look forward to collaborating with you in future as you roll out the handbook. Uh, thank you to our speakers from IFC, Center for Environmental Rights, and the Ghana Sustainable Banking uh, Principles, and uh, to the authors of the handbook again. Thank you to, your, to the participants who joined us today. Um, I'll hand over to Tigis to close us off. So thank you again. Have a great day. Have a great evening. Till next time. Thank you.